The One Thousand and One Nights. Hello, this is Elizabeth, and I am here with the first instalment of one of the most famed and fabulous collections of stories. They began in Persia and India and made their way into Arabia, and for that reason, they are sometimes known as the Arabian Nights. I think some listeners might benefit from a little warning that the heroine has to keep telling stories to save her life, but you can also expect plenty of wonder and amazement. Praise be to Allah, the beneficent King, the creator of the universe, Lord of the three worlds, who set up the sky without pillars to hold it aloft, who stretched out the earth like a bed, and who filled the ocean like a bath. Lend me the art and the craft of she who outwitted a great king, of she who for a thousand and one nights captivated the Shah while she threaded her plots around him, the woman whose stories conquered the hard heart of an all-powerful man and prevented him from carrying out his terrible intent. I speak of her, Scheherazade, the greatest storyteller the world has ever known. She lived in a time of sorrow, for the ruler of the land held in his heart an awful grudge against all women. This grudge had terrible consequences for every family in the land, but it was not always so. He began his reign with a kinder heart. His name was Shariar. He was in the fullness of his youth and power, but as yet without a wife. One evening, he stood with his younger brother, Prince Zaman, on the balcony of the palace which overlooked the pleasure gardens. They watched a young serving girl as she stepped out to the fountain to fetch water. Shariar whispered, See, brother, is she not as lovely as the moon and as graceful as a gazelle? But Zaman replied, Do not let your eyes deceive you. Although you are older than me and more powerful, yet I am more experienced in the ways of women, for I already have a wife. I tell you, no woman on earth has a pure and faithful heart. Each day I watch my queen. I see her give a visiting prince such a look that makes my blood turn angry. But it does not stop there. She gives the chief chamberlain a cheeky smile that is quite inappropriate. Why, the day before I left my palace to pay honour to you, I saw her whispering to the cook. She brings nothing but shame upon me. Sharia laughed. My brother, you have been looking pale and ill of late. Now I know the cause. Jealousy is eating you up because you have such a lovely wife. At this, Zaman became quite offended, but he replied in no more than a mutter. My brother, you will learn for yourself in due time. Sharia was ready to marry. It seemed that wherever he looked, he saw a beautiful woman, but none so lovely as the one the two brothers encountered the very next day. They got up at dawn to go hunting. Just as the sun was spreading its gentle rays, they rode their horses side by side along the seashore. Walking towards them, Along the deserted beach, they saw a girl whose loveliness brought to mind the words. She rose like the morn as she shone through the night. 
When she unveiled her face, the sun grew bright. As the brothers drew near to her, she gave them the sort of smile that gladdens a man's heart. And Sharia said to his brother, I would not be ashamed if she sat beside me as my queen. But no sooner had he spoken than a huge wave came curling into the shore, and standing on top of the wave was a great genie. His skin was orange and his eyes blazing red. As the wave broke into white foam, the genie leapt onto the beach and seized the girl up in his hands. He turned his awful eyes on the brothers, and they were so full of fire that they feared his gaze might burn them up. Then he spoke. His voice was terrible, but his words showed that he intended them no harm. Hear me now and learn from my troubles. When I took this girl for my bride, I set her inside a trunk, and I placed the trunk inside another trunk, and that trunk inside yet another trunk, seven boxes in all, each with its own lock. And then I placed the sevenfold container at the bottom of the sea, so as to keep her faithful to me. But she still managed to escape. If I, a genie, with all the power of magic at my disposal, cannot hold power over my bride. What hope have you mere men of doing so? As soon as he had issued this warning, both the genie and the girl span round and round until they became a whirlwind that sped away across the sea. For the rest of the day, Sharia was pale and brooding. By evening, he had cheered up somewhat. As the brothers stood on the balcony overlooking the gardens once again, he said, The remarkable occurrence of this morning has made a great impression on me. I see now that you are right. The genie has confirmed what you say. But I have thought deeply about this problem all day long, and I have formed a plan. It was not long before his brother and everyone in the land found out what the Shah had in mind. As he sat on his throne the next day, giving orders to his officials about this and that, he sent for his chief minister a man who had served him for many years and who had two lovely daughters whom in time we shall meet, Ishallah, God willing. He commanded the minister to bring a bride to him that very evening and in the morning to take her away to be executed. Each and every day he was to do the same to bring another bride for him to marry, and in the morning to strike off her head. And so it came to pass for three years on end. There was not a family in the land that was not touched by this tragedy. The people cried out against their shah and called on Allah to destroy him and his reign utterly but his heart was relentless. By this terrible plan, he made sure that none of his people would ever gather in a corner and gossip that his queen was faithless to him, either in thought or deed. Mothers wept or fled abroad with their daughters. At last, 
there was hardly a woman left in the city who was of marriageable age. As the minister searched the city, he could not find a bride for the Shah that night. He returned home in sorrow and anxiety, for he was afraid for his own life when he failed that evening to present a new bride to the Shah. Now he had two daughters, Shahrazad and Dunyazad. The eldest had read all the books, legends and stories in the library of the palace. She knew a great many poems off by heart and had studied philosophy and the arts. She was pleasant, polite, wise and witty. She saw that her father was looking sad and she quoted some lines of a poem to him. Tell whoso hath sorrow, grief shall never last. Even as joy hath no morrow, so woe shall go past. When the minister heard these words from his daughter, he told her the cause of his sorrow from first to last. When she had heard it all, Shahrazad exclaimed, how long shall we endure this slaughter of women? I will tell you what is on my mind. Take me to the Shah this night. Let me be his bride. Either I shall live by my wits and save the daughters of this land, or I shall join those who have perished already. The minister heard these words and although he greatly respected his daughter's wisdom, he thought these words were the greatest foolishness he had ever heard. He went to the Shah and confessed that he was unable to bring him any more brides, for there were none left in the land. Shah Shariar sat thoughtfully on his throne and said, None but your own two daughters. Do not hide them from me, or it will cost you your head. And so it was, after long deliberation and much persuasion from Shahrazad, that he brought his own daughter to the Shah as his bride. That night, when Shahrazad lifted the veil from her lovely face, the Shah was pleased with what he saw but there were tears in her eyes. What troubles you? asked the Shah, thinking that he knew the answer. But she replied not that she was afraid of what would happen to her in the morning, but that she was missing her sister. She begged that she could bring her to sleep with them that night, so that she would not be lonely. The Shah willingly agreed and all went according to the plan that the ingenious Shahrazad had formed. Her sister, Dunyazad, slept on a couch at the foot of the royal bed, and towards morning, as she had been told to do by her sister, she awoke and said, Oh, Shahrazad, I cannot sleep. Will you not tell me one of your wonderful stories? for there is not a soul on this earth who can spin a tale as delightful and delectable as yours. And Shahrazad stirred and said, I too cannot sleep, and I will tell you a tale with joy, if this great king will permit me. The Shah, who was also sleepless and restless, was pleased with the prospect of hearing a tale. And so Shahrazad began to relate the first story of the A Thousand and One Nights. If you would like to hear it and find out if she lives to tell another tale, you will have to be patient and look out for the next story from the A Thousand and One Nights on storynori.com. We don't yet have a thousand and one stories on Story Nori, but we do count them in the hundreds. They are all free for you to listen to and enjoy. 
and if you are able, please consider sending us a small donation. You can find the button in our sidebar. For now, from me, Elizabeth, goodbye.